7 this evening is in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, beginning there in the first verse. Here God promises Abraham he will establish an everlasting covenant with him and his descendants. In Christ, the promise God gave to Abraham extends to all nations. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will it greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and said to him, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. Beginning there in the 8th verse. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith has substance. It clings to God's promises even when it does not see the reality which it confesses. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was buried, was unable to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not perceive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The first book of the New Testament begins by focusing on the genealogy of Jesus, much like Genesis chapter 5 initiates by saying, this is the book of the generations back. Matthew sketches the human landscape for a thousand years, from and beyond, from Abraham, Israel's patriarch, down through David, through the Savior of Israel to the nations. He forms a bridge of sorts from the great areas of sacred history to the climax of all of history when the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, took place. Jesus relates both the glorious elements of that history and the tragic ones. He makes no discrimination. He hides nothing. Jesus is the descendant of King David, as well as the descendant of <coughs> defeated Israelites captive who made their way back home from the nation of Babylon. He was raised in the Galilee of the Gentiles, where the Jews and the Gentiles entered Mingle on the northern part of Israel. There, under the authority of the Roman Jews, and there, the people of Israel tried and struggled to be faithful to the word of the Lord in and amidst that pagan culture that dominated the region. Throughout his gospel, Matthew emphasizes how Jesus taught and how he fulfills all of the promises of the Old Testament. And he does so for the sake of God's people. And so in his gospel, seemingly written as an instruction for Jewish Christians to help them better understand how the Old Testament prophecies 
are fulfilled in the salvation history of Jesus were the 35 times he quotes the prophets. The early church used this gospel of Matthew as its primary teaching book, more so than the other gospels. It begins, this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew visualizes the Holy Family back even into history, a thousand years back to the time of David. And if you, again, you, this evening use the church aisle as a timeline with the cradle here at the front step. David would appear about midway down the aisle, a thousand years before the birth of Christ. But he doesn't stop at David, does he? He goes back even to the first patriarch, the one with whom God made the eternal covenant, Abraham. And on our timeline, Abraham and the entry into that covenant might be perhaps at the doors as we enter our sanctuary this evening. Through the ages, the history of the family of God grows and develops as Matthew traces the story down through the ages Genesis 17, which we read earlier, says in part, As for me, God said, This is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants. So if you want to talk about the family, that's where we begin. Matthew begins with Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac the father of Jacob. And Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Aram, and Aram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nashim. Nashim, the father of Solomon, and Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Some famous names that we recognize, some familiar names. Fourteen generations in all, Matthew counts from Abraham to Jesus, or to David, excuse me. But the family history continues. We pick it up with Solomon, and Rehoboam, and Abijah, and, Ash, and Asaph, and Jehoshaphat, and Joram, and Uzziah, and Jotham, and Ahab, Hezekiah, and Manasseh, Amos, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. So in the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew makes no effort to hide sinners and scandals, does he? Instead, he highlights them for us. Here we see Jesus' ancestors include, well, who? Rahab the prostitute, right? Ruth the Gentile. It includes adulterers and violent men. All were people very much like the people in the world around us that we see today, don't we? In fact, they're very much regular, everyday people, much like you and I are. Sinners of all descriptions. The story of Jesus' origin now continues with Joseph, who serves as a model for believers. Eliezer, the father of Matan, and Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. And so tonight we see Matthew is in a way a family man. It's especially in Matthew's Gospel that we see the Holy Family and that family in action beginning with Joseph. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, 
He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph knew, or thought he knew, the reason for Mary's pregnancy. But he wanted to treat her justly. He wanted to be merciful to her because he loved her. He didn't want her persecuted, prosecuted, and stoned to death. It took an angel of the Lord, however, the power to explain to Joseph just how much of a family man God had intended him to be. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so when God's angel reveals now to Joseph the unique miracle foretold in the prophet Isaiah to Ahaz, the king, of a virginal conception, Joseph believes the angel. He fulfilled his responsibilities and honors his pledge he marries Mary and raises Jesus as his own. As a family man, Joseph responds not with words. In fact, if you notice, Joseph's words are never recorded in the scripture. <coughs> but Joseph responds with the Holy Family, and yet as Matthew views the situation for us here, the Holy Family is much more than simply three people. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph, Mary, the baby Jesus. Here is the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew is indeed a family man, and God is faithful in all things, and God has a plan and a purpose for our lives and for the life of this child who fulfills the line of prophet from the time of Adam. Yes, Jesus, because we are told all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Five times now in the infancy of Christ, Matthew is going to use this formula about the prophecies. It next appears as God employs a star and the scriptures and a dream to guide the Magi from the eastern lands to Bethlehem. The wise men will stop in Jerusalem and ask where the king of the Jews will be born, and this is what will be told to them. In Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. They were the first Gentiles, of course, to worship Jesus. After God's warning to Joseph in a dream, when the Holy Family was forced to flee, and of course fleeing from the murderous wrath of King Herod, the Idumean, the Edomite, the formula appears once again. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I call my son. The murder of the boys in Bethlehem, likewise. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were no more. Jesus escapes the hand of Herod that night but not simply to escape death, because later 
he would have died, wouldn't he? He escaped death that night to die on the cross to take away our sins. And everyone knows, as cruel as Aaron is or was, and as innocent as the young infants in Bethlehem may have been, he died for people just like that. And people just like you and I this evening. And so, when the end of the sojourn in Egypt took place, an angel of the Lord appeared again in a dream to Joseph and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. And Joseph took his little family, the holy family, to Nazareth, rather than just stay in Bethlehem. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. It's only right that Matthew should include all of this salvation history for us, going all the way back through David to Abraham as part of the greater family story of God's holy family. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. For in Jesus, Matthew sees the whole history of God's family not only being reenacted in Christ, but also brought to fulfillment. From the land to which God had called Abraham, to the land to which God later called the Israelites home from Babylon, is the land to which God called the Magi, men who looked to the stars as once God turned Abraham Christ to the stars, so that he could comprehend the vastness of God's purpose and plan. For you and I. So much is the love of God. For in Jesus all is fulfilled. Yes. A new king is born in the city of David. And already in the circumstances of his birth and infancy. We see the word of God is already being fulfilled. In him. Again. And again. And again. And although, all through it all, the family is preserved, the purpose fulfilled in this, the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Only sinners, you see, make up Jesus' genealogy there. His ancestors needed a Savior just as much as he or I need a Savior. If God in His grace can use flawed and sinful people like that, how much more can He bless you and I, we sinners, who witness the Messiah's sinless sacrifice and believe in Him today? <coughs> so, through His Word, our Heavenly Father guides all nations to the Christ, the Messiah of God. When threatening challenges surround us, we trust in God. God is in control. God is protecting us. God is watching over us every bit as much as he watched over his own pure son. He does it because he loves him. And through faith, you and I have been adopted into that greater holy family, haven't we? His church. He protects us. He watches over us. Jesus' sacrifice, his innocent life, redeemed us from sin and death and the power of the devil. Trusting in Jesus, we can now stand before our Heavenly Father in innocence and in righteousness and in blessedness. St. John the Apostle tells us that Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent or of human, not of natural descent or of uh, human decision or husband's will. But from of God. Tonight we see Matthew is a family man. And now is his gospel. 
the inspired Word of God, which invites us, like the wise men of old, to become part of that salvation history. To see ourselves by God's invitation and leading members of His family. Remember your baptism. In the water of the Word, God made you sinless in Christ Jesus. He adopted you into that family. Remember your confirmation in faith, at which time you renewed that baptismal vow and made the pledge to be faithful to Christ even to the point of death. Yes, we are part of his family, the church. And his love and his care for you and I is new every morning. Recall what God has done for you in the words spoken by the angel. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people their sins. As we watch and as we wait in this Advent season for the return of Christ, in looking into the Word, it reminds us that by grace through faith, in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. As St. Paul writes, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So, you are no longer a slave, you are God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Welcome to the Holy Family, the family of God. Amen.